Hello, everybody. I know some of you are still connecting to the audio, so we're going to take just a few minutes to let everybody get in. We're still admitting everybody. This is the Science and Technology Committee, so welcome. Uh, today we have Lou Hughes, the CEO of Moving Minds. And again, I know some of you are still connecting to the audio, so welcome, everybody. Today we have Lou Hughes, the CEO of Moving Minds. And this is the Science and Technology Committee. So welcome everybody. We do wanna welcome you to turn on your video cameras because we would love to see your smiling face if you feel comfortable. It is not required, but we do want to see your smiling face if possible. Hi Joan, hi James. I see Bob and Patheria and Mark, and I'm sorry I don't know your first name, but Potter is the last name. Hello and welcome everybody. Today we have Lou Hughes, the CEO of Moving Minds. This is the Science and Technology Committee. This meeting is being recorded, so please keep yourselves muted. And with that being said, Lou, I am going to hand it over to you. Good morning, everybody. How are uh, I see some folks drinking some coffee, so I know it's a little early to be getting uh, a marketing presentation, but I uh, appreciate all of you joining us, certainly. I see James and Joan and Mark. Um, I'd like to, uh, to walk through uh, a pretty substantial amount of information this morning, and I would like to also welcome any questions that you have during the presentation, or certainly we can table those at the end, so feel free to Ping Kirby or myself during uh, the content uh, presentation, and we can do our best to answer any questions that you have. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes, uh, we can. Uh, all right, great. We can. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and if you hand controls, are we in good shape? You are. You can share now. All there right. we go. I'm going to put this on view slide. So today's presentation is about building a marketing tech organization designed for scalable growth. And there's a lot to cover here, so let's get started. Today's discussion, the framework for that, I wanted to cover some of the agenda, most of which you saw as you visited the landing page and registered for the event. But we're going to talk about common pitfalls in executing multi-channel programs, aligning marketing budgets to growth targets, blending the art and marketing to drive growth, First, the essential components of what is called a MarTech stack, and then how do you measure ROI of your marketing investments? So let's get started. First, let me just say a few words about Moving Minds. We actually are new to Palm Beach. We just relocated our company after being based in North Florida for many years. We've been around for 14 years, in fact. Uh, we generally serve as a fractional chief marketing officer to fast growing emerging type of companies with private equity, VC companies to essentially stand up what is a marketing operation. And generally they look to us to force all of that. And we're able to sort of accelerate the ability for them to go to market. So rather than recruiting a VP of marketing and a bunch of team members to manage the functional aspects of marketing, we assemble a team in weeks rather than what generally takes months or even in some cases years to implement. And uh, we'll share with you some of the work that we've done thus far. So let's talk ab about the challenges we all face as marketers. Um, you have a proliferation right now of, of new channels from TikTok and Snapchat, if you have children, to what are still considered new media, which is over 10 years old, which includes Facebook and Twitter. And then of course you've got traditional means of reaching customers like direct mail and radio and television, even though those have also been fragmented over the years with cable television, iHeartRadio and so forth. The challenge is how do you, based on all of these different platforms and distribution channels, how do you execute multi-channel? So you want concentrated force when you're delivering marketing. A lot of clients, a lot of companies generally do sort of ad hoc execution. They don't do multiple channels and they generally don't do well, right? So they invest a lot in a particular niche or a one to three channels, don't have success with it and they don't stick with it and thus don't have success. So it's really important to, to stay consistent and persistent with 
multi-channel. And that means really distributing your information and content over perhaps even 10 to 15 different channels. Measurement, you know, when you have to stand up in front of a board and present the, the findings and the results of the investments that they've asked you to make, obviously you wanna be able to quantify the investments and prove your worth. A lot of times CMOs are exited from companies because they can't show the ROI on the investment. So it's critical to put that infrastructure in place to be able to do that. And we'll talk a little bit about that uh, in a few minutes. Resources and allocation. Nobody has a, uh, an unlimited amount of resources. So how you smartly and intelligently distribute the resources that you do have is really important as well. And those are person, you know, the personnel as well as the financial resources. And then of course, we're now bridging marketing and technology. It used to be, you know, put an ad in the paper and make it look great and have essentially no connection to technology. IT was a separate department completely from marketing and only when the website needed to be updated did they actually interface. Well now, technology and, and marketing are completely intertwined and almost critically essential to be able to be able, you know, to be able to scale for growth. And we'll talk a little bit that, about that as well. Data, you know, data is one of the um, probably underestimated piece of information that most marketers and even senior leadership take for granted. Uh, a lot of companies don't manage data very well. They don't have personnel to manage it. They don't have processes to manage it. They have disparate silos of information. It makes it really hard to be able to execute programs, marketing programs, if you have bad data. And then of course, finding and orchestrating the talent, right? So if you're running across multiple channels, you need experts in those channels to be able to execute. And finding those resources can be very hard. One of the value propositions that Moving Minds has is that we find that talent and assemble the team on the client's behalf. And generally we work for CEOs and sometimes CMOs, Chief Marketing Officers. So let's talk about aligning budgets to growth targets. You've got to know what you're measuring, what we call the KPIs. If you don't know that, you're going to be in trouble. And uh, you've got to be able to understand what is the growth targets are and what are the things that are going to affect the positive impact to the business. So let's take a look at some of those metrics. You may be familiar with them or have seen them before, but it's cost per acquisition, which is called CPA, customer lifetime value, CLV, conversion rate at each stage of the funnel, conversion rate per channel, and the duration of the sales cycle. So if it's a consumer product, obviously it's shorter cycle. B2B selling software, whatever it is, professional services is gonna have a more significant sales cycle of anywhere from six to 12 months. These are just a few of the metrics. There's a whole higher level of uh, metrics that we'll share with you as well. You gotta know your sources of revenues, right? So there's tools now in place to be able to attribute sources of revenue and where your customers are coming from. Some of those are free resources like Google Analytics, which is a great tool. Uh, and some are software packages that allow you to be able to measure this. One of those is called Visible. This is a solution that we use and generally implement for clients that allows us to attribute revenue realization to the actual channel that was, uh, that that communication was distributed. So on the left-hand side of the graph in very small letters, you can see web referrals, social media, SEO, sales, partners, paid media, offline media, marketing operations, events, and direct. So we can then make decisions with the software package based on what channels are working and what's really driving revenue. Without tools like this, you can't, Really do that and that becomes very challenging. So we generally help clients implement the tools. We help them find the right tools based on their circumstances and help them implement the right tools. You've got to develop an acquisition model. So you need to understand the CPA because that's essential to be able to, to substantiate the investments that you need in order to reach a particular target in customer acquisition, number of new patients, whatever that target is. This is a funnel, what we call the marketing Funnel. Some of you, again, may be aware of what this is, but it's, it's essentially um, a phased approach to the buying process. So at the top of the funnel, we build awareness for a particular solution or product. And then as you narrow that funnel down, you see interest and evaluation and decision process. And then, of course, ultimately the purchase. And then there's a reevaluation and repurchasing as well. So you look at customer lifetime value is really where that's impacted. 
the goal is to widen the funnel as wide as possible because that shows that your throughput is very effective. When it's narrow, like this particular example, you're really going to struggle. Uh, the cost of marketing and a little realization of revenue here. So these are some funnel metrics I'll share with you. Um, at the highest level, we're dealing with bounce rates and impressions, average time on the web website, web traffic. In the middle of the funnel, you've got open rates and lead, lead scores, conversion rates and click-throughs. And at the very bottom, as I mentioned, you have revenue attribution. That's really the hardest part in terms of granularity to connect the dots. Most people have the top of funnel metrics taken care of. Most have the middle of the funnel taken care of. Very few have revenue attribution uh, figured out. And there are new tools that allow us to do that, including Visible, which I just shared with you. You got to be realistic. Um, most people aren't, right? And that senior, the executive team, uh, generally is not realistic. Uh, and that's why CMOs don't last more than 23 months on average they're exited because of the alignment or misalignment of expectations with the reality of the investments that are required to really drive growth. So let's just take a case study here. This is an actual client case study, a recent one. The goal of the client was to generate 500 consultations. So as you saw that funnel going down, we actually flip the funnel up, right? So we take the basis, what is the net result we want? We flip it upside down and then we develop an acquisition uh, model that helps us determine what the right level of ad spend will be. So in this case, we had um, for this particular keyword to drive this type of consultation, when you're dealing with keywords, it's extremely expensive. So we're talking about anywhere from $5.50 to $8.50 per click through. Uh, and then we've got to be able to measure the results. So we put some call tracking in place to be able to we didn't want to depend on the actual um, on the sales operations team to report the metrics. Marketing needs to own the metrics so that we can validate, trust, but verify, as Ronald Reagan used to say. So we put call tracking in place and we could then have control. And in some cases, you can record the conversations to develop what uh, what the conversion rate is and the effectiveness of the inbound sales team is to converting that particular lead. So if you do the math here, you look at the cost per click through of anywhere from 550 to 850. And this is a fairly crude analysis here at a high level. Our landing page where we drive all of that traffic has an 8.5% conversion rate, which is almost unheard of. Uh, the general conversion rate on a landing page industry wide is 2.5%. So in order to generate that 500 number of consultations, we have to generate 10,000 click throughs. And at a cost of 550 to 850, you're dealing with almost 55 to 85 thousand dollars of ad spend. Now, if you look at what's that going to realize in terms of revenue, with just 70 thousand dollars in booked revenue, because each appointment or consultation is 140 dollars. Then you've got to factor in the cost of additional labor, which is 35 thousand. You're likely to lose on this campaign anywhere from. $70,000. So you can see by working backwards through the funnel, you recognize this probably not a great investment. Now, one thing to consider, if you know what your customer lifetime value is, you can use this particular campaign as a loss leader, right? So if we think we can generate $3,500 over the course of months by acquiring that particular client, the twenty to 70,000 K turns into a more significant amount of revenue. That loss then over time, over a course of 18 months, will turn into a profit. So that's really important to know what the CLV is to make decisions. And a lot of times people go on gut and don't really look at the metrics here because this is really probably not a great investment, particularly if you can't turn that particular consult into a longer term relationship. You've got to have the buy-in and support of leadership. This is absolutely critical. First, you have to have the funds and the resources to be able to build a team to execute. And if they're not supportive, you're dead in the water, to be honest. And you've really got to have a supportive board of directors, um, you've got to have a supportive executive team, and then you've got to be able to, to deliver. There's other ways of looking at the marketing budget as well. You can evaluate your competitor's spend, which is an important criteria that we use often to develop budget on behalf of a client. 
This is a tool we use called SEM Rush. SEM Rush is a software package that is relatively expensive that we use. And what you can see from this particular dashboard, we develop a budget at our competitors. We look at what you see on the upper left hand corner with Annex Search. So this is the traffic that's derived by their content marketing, where they rank on Google Search for particular keywords. And as you can see, they're driving almost 1.6 million uh, users or visitor sessions, which is down 3% in this particular instance. They have to supplant that with paid search, so keyword-oriented advertising. And in that case, they, they are seeing a 37% increase in traffic, which is pretty astronomical, but they're having to spend an enormous amount of money to be able to generate that throughput. SEM Rush also you give a ton of other analytics. You can see backlinks and you can track your position ranking. In this case, it also shows you display advertising. So you can see what type of banner ads and how much spend your competitors are using. In this case, there is no display advertising. Generally, there is a combination of paid search, which is keyword oriented with display. In this case, there isn't. But this is a great tool to be able to see exactly how your competitors are allocating their funds. You also see through this particular uh, screen, type of creative and what messaging you're using to be able to refine your own messaging, which is critically important because that has an impact on your conversion rate and setting the expectations for when they do get to that landing page that they convert and that's critically important. So this is really helpful across a number of criteria. You also have to know you versus your industry, right? So you need to know what in generalities companies are spending in your particular industry because they're competing with you. So I think these numbers are a little high. Um, you know, historically, you know, what I have seen in the almost 30 years of marketing experience that I have, generally the number is anywhere from three to 5% of revenue spent on marketing, not so much on sales. When you combine the two, it's generally perhaps 10%. In this case, you can see consumer packaged goods companies are spending almost 24% of their revenue on marketing. If you think about CPG companies, they have broad distribution, consumer focused, they have national media buys, whereas other types of companies can focus their ad spend on more geo-targeted types of investments, whether it be keyword related, geofencing type of advertising and other things. In software, they're spending 15% roughly, communications and professional services around 13 to 12%. So again, I think these numbers are fairly high high relative to probably what you all are investing in marketing generally, because these are higher than what I have experienced generally with our client as well. But what's the correlation between advertising spend and marketing and growth? And so there's a couple of slides here I'd like to share with you. These are new and emerging companies. So it depends on what the expectations of your board are. So if the board is looking for fast growth, uh, and a surge of customer acquisition and to be able to sell the company within a span of three to five years, these are the types of companies that you really want to look at, right? So they're investing a tremendous amount up to 30, almost 40, 46% in some cases. Tableau is spending 51% of revenue and that's generating a 32% revenue growth year over year. So you just consistently see with a high level of investment, it's having a huge return. Now, the irony is, of course, the company at the bottom, which is spending just 8% of revenue in sales and marketing, saw a decrease of almost 2%. So again, you can see the correlation. Now, these are fast moving, very emerging uh, companies that want to be able to, uh, to grow really quickly. Now, in some cases, um, you have more established technology companies. So you see the rate of growth is not the same. However, 11% uh, for Google is significantly more revenue than a smaller emerging company. But in this case, you still see Microsoft investing 15%, Google's 12%, Oracle's 22%, and, and Intel is 12%. In manufacturing and education, you, you see also pretty consistently high levels for really, uh, mature companies, 17 30%, 14%. And I'd be interested to share, to learn from you sort of where you guys are relative to what you're seeing with your particular companies and industry. We can talk about that at the end. So what's the art and science of marketing? Let's talk a little bit about that and the importance of it. The science of marketing, as we shared with you, the technology, the underpinning of the stack is, is burned the last five years. 
you know, previously when you had the Marlboro Man, it was a simple ad executed across radio or television till that was banned and then print. Now you've got um, tools that enable us to be able to measure performance that didn't exist before. But the art of marketing is still critically important. And the importance of your brand identity and breaking through that clutter because you're, you're dealing with a lot of competitors and frankly, people are inundated with creative and messaging. You know, ten, you know what's the, the metrics like 50 times a day you see messaging. Uh, and the colors and the logo are, should be used to build equity over time. You think about Coca-Cola's brand over 100 years old, that color red, the curvature of their brand, and you can take the logo off of the creative and you instantly recognize that that's Coca-Cola. That's sort of the holy grail of where you want to go. Even if you're a small company, you want to be consistent. And the other component the value of creating a consistent and unique brand identity is that it helps you get more mileage out of your ad spend, right? So if your client or your, I'm sorry, if your competitor has a very dull generic representation of their brand, they're gonna to have to spend almost 10 times the amount of money in ad spend. Whereas if you have a very unique brand that's differentiated in color or in the look and feel or even the messaging, you have the ability to, to spend one X because that one singular is going to stretch a lot farther than what is generic representation of a brand. And then of course, one of the most important things is you proliferate multi-channel campaigns, whether you're using different agencies to do that or whether you're using a singular agency, it's still challenging to develop a consistent representation that's uniform and standardized across all, and that includes messaging, not just the visual identity. Really challenging uh, as a marketer to be able to do that, as you well know. So the power of a brand, you know, you want to differentiate by your, you want to differentiate by your messaging, you want to differentiate by quality, emotion, the experience they have in dealing with you, you know, either on a product basis, shipping is an experience, right? The expectation, being able to track a package and when it's going to be delivered, right? So you see companies like Shop, which is an app that allows you to track a package from its, uh, from its ship date, all the way through the delivery, which is incredible. So companies that are offering that sort of level of granularity impact the experience and the likelihood for you to buy again. And then of course, cost is always a consideration, but if you address all of the differentiation factors above, cost is less of a, of a concern, right? Now let's take an example of a client, a current client, Jupiter Medical Center. We were brought on in January um, and of course, right after that COVID hit. So, you know, we recognize this can present an opportunity. Uh, and so for the last, you know, six months, we've been wrestling with really trying to get patients to feel comfortable coming back to undertake whatever care that they may, may need for heart disease or orthopedic surgery or whatever, whatever it may be. Um, the volume went down and then our job as marketers is to drive comfort levels higher. Uh, the hospital is a safe, probably the safest place you can be to receive care, safer than a Publix, for example, because of the criteria and the CDC guidelines that are adhered to and the cleaning processes that the, the hospital undertook. Uh, and they had visionary leadership, you know, Dr. Ramit Rostogi, Steve Seeley, you know, Hawking, recognized that it was an opportunity because competitors were pulling back on ads it was our opportunity to actually push forward on rebranding the hospital and getting out there and putting uh, sort of a dominating mark on the region. And that's the goal is to create a regional medical center, not a local sort of Jupiter community hospital. And we've undertaken that process. Historically, they generally did, I would call it dormant marketing, really, it was, it was asleep. And um, what was essentially executed were ad hoc campaigns, as I described to you before, they might have done direct mail, they may have done some web, they may have done this or that, but none of it was concentrated um, and executed in a multi-channel way. And most of it was ineffective relative to that. Now we took Uh oh, I think we lost there you, Lou. Oh, there we went tomorrow. Hey Lou. Oh, uh oh, you're muted. Lou, I think you paused for just a moment. Can you go back just a little bit? And you are muted. So if you could unmute yourself. Not there sure we go. how that <laughs> Okay. Okay. 
you were back. Sorry about Thank that. You. I'm not sure what happened there. But, uh, <laughs> nevertheless, um, you know, we, we wanted to, you know, the, it's the highest rated healthcare system in the region. So we wanted to anchor the position on its strengths. And at the time, it wasn't so obvious, but now it certainly is. And um, we wanted to also differentiate, as I mentioned before, around the visual identity of the organization. So this is what we inherited as, a, as an agency and we began the transition. This was created by an agency in Chicago and what I would call a sort of cookie cutter execution where they sort of stamp on a different logo and take this and sell this in different markets. It, it, the campaign was based on a double negative, right? This, this is not a comeback. I'm not your mini me. You know, we felt like uh, positioning a, a hospital system or any company for that matter around a negative it's really not a good idea. We don't want people to think not and associate that with the medical center or any company. So we recognize that this campaign was, was not going to perform well. And you can see the difference in the visual identity as well, right? So one has a straight line with green and a, and a yellow stripe. And then on the other execution, you have this curvy wave with blue and green. So completely different a, a visual identity between the two ads and for the same organization. Lou, I think we lost you again. Did I don't know if it's you yes, you're back. All right, so maybe my internet connection is not particularly good. So I apologize <laughs> for that. So you know, when you have a visual identity that is different between two ads for the same organization, it's it's almost unheard of, and it's kind of marketing malpractice because you want your identity to be consistent across all of your execution. So when you think about you know, the inspiration for the new campaign, when you think about Palm Beach and Jupiter and this particular area, you have to think about top of mind is Lily Pulitzer. I mean, what a great brand. It's worldwide now. And the colors, you know, are associated, right? When you think of Palm Beach, you think of the pinks and the teals. And so we wanted to build that into the uniqueness of Jupiter's position. And we also looked at just the natural habitat. If you think about the sea grape, which is pretty prolific, you know, grows prolifically around Jupiter. The spine of a sea grape is pink. And so we use that as inspiration as well to create their new identity. So we started with the anchoring the brand position on the safest, highest quality medical center. And we used all of the accreditations, the medals that you see in the creative on the left as the anchor, right? To create the fact that it is the highest rated and to show that. And then we created a tagline, which was kind of uh, ironic in a sense. As we, we met with a the client, they you know, everybody said, you know, for the highest quality medical care, you know, this is really where you want to be. This is where your family needs to be. And it was authentic. And so we took a phrase which you know, normally wouldn't be associated with a hospital because people don't be in a hospital and use that to create some conversation around their, their identity. We also are using the Lily Putzer and the, and the teal to differentiate. So when you think about St. Mary, other competitors, very bland, very generic execution, similar to what I shared with you, we wanted our brand to pop off of the page and for people to say, holy mackerel, what is this? And this campaign has been running since June, and now we're moving into service lines. So what you see on the right-hand side is the use of the accreditation to demonstrate the fact that they're the leader, really in the state of Florida, for orthopedic care. So that's the, the representation here. I'd like to share with you some of the, the video creative that we also have produced on their behalf. Can you see that okay, Kirby? I can see it. Is there supposed to be sound to it? No, there's no sound. Okay, okay. But this is a, see it fine. <laughs> this is a digital, I should have given some context. This is a digital billboard that was created to run in the West Palm Beach area, uh, or airport, I should say. So it has no sound because of that particular application, but it could certainly have sound. This is another one using the tagline that we created. So again, so you can see sort of the execution in print and then the execution in digital is consistent and very, you know, this is a 10, 10 foot execution in the baggage claim, it's going to explode off of the off of the wall, essentially, and that's really the goal of the creative here. So, when you look at developing 
running a multi-channel campaign, we want to multiply that across all of the channels. And then you can see here from all the different create social, uh, video, print advertising, um, virtual uh, events, and, and display and banners, you've got a consistency here that drives a lot of equity over the course of time. And then as, a, as an agency, we work with the client to execute integrated multi-channel campaigns. So that includes everything from print ads to, you know, to web, to search, to direct mail. We integrate all of that and we as an agency generally orchestrate that. And that can be very hard to orchestrate if you don't have the resources. And fortunately, we've been given a, a vast amount of resources by the hospital to really put them on the map. And again, that's a credit to the leadership team who, who recognizes the opportunity with COVID to really differentiate and put themselves on the map. So what are the components of a MarTech stack? Um, let's talk about sort of the underpinnings and scalable growth. And um, you've got what I call the foundation. So it's a combination of things uh, that we generally use to build that foundation. So starting in the middle on the top, you see market opportunity, right? So that's what is our market size? What is our market share? And how do we go to market? So looking at the bottom part underneath that circle, you see what the go to market strategy is. So what's our positioning? What's our value proposition? How do we differentiate our message in the market through the brand and creative, which I shared with you for Jupiter? Uh, how do we develop content that people can find? Discoverability is critical today, and that's through organic search. You've got data analytics, right? So you target using data outbound and you use data and analytics to make decisions about your marketing investments as that, as that traffic and those customers come to you. And then of course you have to execute, you know, there's now customer experience officers. So it's expanded beyond just a chief marketing officer. Now you have experience officers, which are responsible for the entire journey of the customer and that particular experience. And you look at really the customer lifetime value rather than what is traditionally a role where you're just dealing with the creative and the messaging. So the, the expansiveness of the CEO's role now is significantly different than it was five years ago. And then you underpin that with, the, as we talked about, the systems, the platforms, and the tools. We've shared with you Visible, shared with you SEM Rush, and there's a whole host of other solutions that are out there that we'll share with you that need to be combined Rated stack. And then on the left hand side and the right hand side, you see all of the marketing channels that are available. Lou, I think we lost you again. Uh oh. Uh, there we go. Now I can hear you. It says my connection is unstable, so I can thank AT&T for that. Oh. Um, so on the left and the right are the channels, right? So combining all of your execution and distributing your messaging and your look and feel and your brand, the value proposition across all of those channels is what we talked about earlier, which is very challenging to do, particularly with limited resources. That's kind of our value proposition. We can orchestrate those campaigns on behalf of a client almost seamlessly, what we call marketing on autopilot, essentially. So we'll develop that and execute it on their behalf. This is another way to look at the foundation of marketing technology. So again, you have market opportunity on the top, you have the target markets, your go-to-market, your brand creative, and then you have the channels in the middle. So television, email, content, thought leadership, social events. And then underneath that, you've got a, a foundation of content, the data analytics, the experience, and the systems platforms. This is just a different representation of what we call Now, this is another representation presentation based on the customer journey. So at the very top arrow, you see awareness, you see coming to a website, you see data management, re-engagement, interaction, and management. And these are all of the, the sampling of all the tools that are available as a marketer. And the complexity of combining all of these things together is what makes uh, a CMO worth their salt. And generally, we will help build the infrastructure for a client if they don't have it, or we'll take an inherited infrastructure and improve it by either filling gaps with where they need to have technologies to be able to support what it is they're doing. But you can see on the left-hand side, you've got paid media, social webinars. So those are the lead generation mechanisms. And as those leads come in, you've got landing pages and web infrastructure, your CRM system, your marketing automation system, 
Then you've got outbound email and you've got uh, support platforms and customer communication platforms that allow you to nurture that relationship over time. And then on the far right-hand side, you've got the analytics platform, which include Google Analytics, Tableau, and I shared with you the visible software application earlier in, uh, in the presentation. So that is the presentation. Uh, I know we rattled off a lot of information. Um, it's, uh, it's a pretty complex, but a lot of fun to do what we do. We love what we're doing. We love having success on behalf of our clients. And I think we take a very comprehensive view of marketing and hopefully you'll, you'll feel the same. So this is um, you know, a master's degree in marketing um, in a period of about 30 minutes. So I would welcome to open up the floor and uh, share any of my thoughts with you and certainly answer any questions that you have. I know we went through a lot of information in a very short period of time. We did. Well, thank you so much, Lou. That was fantastic. And I learned a lot of things I never even thought about. Like with the, the brand, I mean, I know branding is super important, but with the keywords and the content, it, it's just all new to me. And maybe that's just because it's not really my industry, but it's super important information that I need to know, even though I'm not dealing with it every single day. So thank you so much for that. We my do pleasure. have, so we have people asking, will the slides be shared? I can certainly share the slides. Yeah, I'd okay. be happy to do that. Okay. So if you send that to me, I will send it out to all of our attendees today. Um, do we have any questions? I, I want to welcome you to turn on your microphone if you have one. James, I see you turned off or you unmuted yourself. Did you have a question? Yeah, Lou, I saw when you put in those slides for Jupiter Medical Center, all those badges on there. The one thing that I'd say about something like that is you had CMS, and there was another batch that had the Blue Cross Blue Shield symbol on there. Everyone knows that Blue Cross Blue Shield is the end all of health insurance. But if someone has one of the other health insurance policies, such as Molina, A Invest, or something like that, they may not think that they can go there. That's the whole thing. I had a guy one time, he wanted to go to some place that I told him about. He went there. I thought they accept their all insurance. They don't accept his insurance. So this is something that is very important when people see things, they understand that I can go there no matter what insurance that I have. Yeah, that's kind of a two separate thing. So on the website, we're continuously updating the insurances that are generally accepted. And that's very dynamic a lot. And that's readily accessible when you do, normally when you go to provider that's generally the first question that you ask and they would generally ask that question of you as well because they want they don't want to have an appointment with a with a particular patient and and then disappoint that patient by not accepting their insurance and that maybe that's their practice but generally you'll do the insurance coverage sort of um uh, you know sort of review uh, particularly in addiction treatment for example because they don't want a lead coming in Qualify and your insurance coverage is how you qualify a particular patient. So um, that's just that's different though than the metal, which is which is essentially you saw the CMS. So you're obviously clearly familiar with that. And most most people don't know what CMS, but it's the federal government's uh, highest criteria for the quality and safety of a medical center. They're the only four star medical center in the region. They were five-star previously, and I suspect they'll also be five-star return to their five-star rating. And they're on par really with some of the greatest national brands you can think of, the Cleveland Clinics. And that's our goal, is to keep people um, in market, not go out of market, because there are, a lot of people here have the wherewithal to go out of market. And our job as marketers is to, is to share the quality of the institution so that they choose to stay here and then, of course, to broaden their reach across the, the market. So we wanted to go, you know, 60% of their businesses in a certain area. We wanted to expand that across the region into Martin County and Indian River because people will travel for certain types of procedures and treatment like cancer. But the, the Blue Distinction Award is very different. That's, that doesn't necessarily have a correlation to coverage. That has a correlation to quality. Um, and they're only one, they're the only uh, uh, medical center in the entire state of Florida that has both three joint commission medals for gold seals in orthopedics combined with two in the blue distinction, which is the Blue Cross Blue Shield Association. They're the only one in the entire state, which is remarkable uh, for a 240 bed hospital. 
I've got an amazing team of professionals and physicians there. So we use that medal because they earn that distinction because of the quality of the care that you get there. It doesn't really have a correlation to the coverage that, that they would accept because they accept, you know, almost, you know, 40 to 50 different types of insurance. All right. Well, thank you. That was a good, good little chat we had there. Mark, did you have something to add? Yeah, I do. I appreciate your presentation. My apologies for turning away for a few minutes. We, we're getting ready to start uh, back to campus here with our students. So we're really excited about that. On a limited basis. What's Mark, what school are you associated with? I'm with South University here in West Palm Beach. We're actually located in Royal Palm Beach, uh, but we uh, relocated from West Palm uh, several years ago. So uh, I had a question in reference to your breakdown of expenditures. We have um, campuses uh, along, basically along the East Coast, um, Savannah, Richmond, uh, up that way. And so we have a national campaign that is, is pretty robust. I'm not so sure we're even getting close to, you know, the 10 or 11 percent region that I've seen uh, on, a, on expenditures. I think it's probably more like four or five. And then on the local side of the house, we get pennies. And so uh, the campus leaders across all of our South campuses are responsible then for some of the local efforts that are, that are undertaken uh, along with our senior director of admissions. So we kind of work collaborative, collaboratively with a marketing director and then also on our national arm that does most of the marketing. Uh, but I, as I look at uh, kind of what we receive here, and right now we're doing very little because of the election. Once the election's over, we'll, we'll pick it back up. Right. But when you have organizations that have, especially on the local level, that have limited resources, I'm always looking for that, you know, that avenue or that channel that's going to give us the biggest bang for our buck. And I believe that's really truly trying to understand your target market. Where do they live? Where do they come from? Uh, but we also need to expand our program reach into various areas and markets. What kind of advice would you give uh, somebody like myself that may only have forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars for a for a particular you know quarter, for example, or even a, for a six month period? Right. So you have a corporate market that we do based in, a, in a national headquarters that kind of distributes the. Uh, the funds that they have across yeah. different campuses and different geo markets. Yeah. yeah. So you're, you know, you're in this kind of position where you're, um, you know, the, the corporate marketing team is, you know, has a lot on their plate. They have a lot of uh, folks who, you know, it's kind of the Oliver twist, right? So it's, you know, coming, coming up, you've got a lot of people that ask for, for investments in their particular service line or product or location. And it's challenging as a corporate marketing person to, to be able to distribute those funds in a way that's proportionate to, you know, the level of growth that they want. Um, you know, the, I think it kind of goes back to the presentation, which was, you know, if we understand the current source of where your, your students are coming from, what the geo-targeted areas, um, you know, if you, you know, there's a lot of data you can look at, you know, depending on their demographics, their income levels, um, you can evaluate where you to concentrate your resources. You can do geofencing or, or geotargeting and digital so that, you know, if your students are coming from a certain mile radius, if they don't, generally how far do they want to travel to, to attend a school like yours? It's probably on average about 15 to, I'd say 15 to 20 miles. And you don't have any residential component, right? It's, it's, commuting, it's commuting, right? Correct. So, you know, in, in that case, you, and it may be happening already, um, but, you know, we, we would probably run a digital campaign. Most of your students are going to be on the emerging platforms like the Snapchats and the Instagrams and those particular, um, not the mature sort of channels, unless you're dealing with perhaps sports where you might want to target ESPN or something. Local cable television is one of the best bargains in, in advertising. Um, you can run on ESPN from, you know, for $30 for a 30 second spot in a geo targeted mm -hmm. area. It's incredibly inexpensive. Now, where it gets expensive is you have to run a lot of frequency, you know, so in order to permeate someone's brain to choose you or even to get to the evaluation stage at the top of the funnel, you gotta really drive with consistency and a high level of frequency for them to begin to absorb that they right. use. Like, that's why car companies advertise consistently because you're not always in the market for a car 
But when you are every three to five years, you know, all of a sudden they're still there, right? And, you're, and you sort of switch goes on and I'm ready to shop a car and then you see that ad. So that's why you see, and, and they're really good at it. They're also getting support from the manufacturers uh, as well, because that helps, you know, they get rebates and they also get uh, co-opt ad dollars. So that helps supplant the sources they may have low spending a ton of money, right? So I think, you know, you probably want to find out what your corporate marketing team is doing to help support you. You might look at, you know, channels like cable television, which is very inexpensive. You, you're going to look at emerging channels like Instagram, which is where all of these kids are, mm-hmm. you know, in the 20 to 26, to even 30, you know, even 40 years old uh, and even older using Instagram. I, I actually interviewed somebody um, uh, the, in Palm Beach or met with someone and they asked me if I had an Instagram account. And I, th- I thought it was the strangest question um, <laughs> because I, I was like, you know, we, we've got a website, we've got, you know, Facebook, we got this and that. And, and they sort of determined um, our relationship based on my Instagram account, which I thought was kind of hysterical. And that yeah. person was in the tw- in their 20s, early 20s. So it's amazing. So generally, you know, con- consumption media is based on generation, right? So you have to be agnostic to what the platforms are that we distribute information on. So in that case, the mix is, you know, high, high level of digital, maybe some cable mixed in, and certainly all of it geolocated in a, sure. in a 15 to 20 mile sure. radius in your market and have that capability before. You know, now you do have the ability to target in a very refined market space. And, you know, we didn't have that ability. Mm. Excellent. Well- Thank you so much. I, I do have to admit, uh, I am an, I am a user of TikTok, but only for construction purposes. They have great <laughs> construction tips. TikTok that, is awesome. <laughs> that you know, you're they see, do. You're starting to see, now my internet connection is unstable again. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, I mean, TikTok is interesting making a transition right now. I don't know if you're on Facebook, you've noticed they, they are spending a ton of money on driving TikTok for business. So, you know, we're, we're changing really the, they're trying to drive businesses to the platform to, uh, you know, to build awareness for construction tips, which drive awareness for that particular company. And so you're, they're starting to shift their market uh, and target area because the business community is, you know, you're talking about a ton of ad spend, whereas the consumer market is not spending any money, right? The, the creators of the platform are the ones making all the money. So this is a big shift for them. Thank you. Wow, well, I know being in my 20s that Instagram is probably my most used app that I have. So I completely agree with with that and the ads that i find on instagram usually always get me i will always click on an ad that pops up on my instagram i i don't trust the facebook ads near as much so it's kind of weird so i i don't know i i I agree with the instagram thing but that might just be my age (laughs) no no it is your age right so i mean you know my children would never look at facebook you know they're 13 and 17 they think facebook and email is like ancient so and they're not on instagram yet so but they're using snapchat they're using and you have to be obviously marketing to to children is very different than marketing to adults but you know they're on snapchat and uh and TikTok, you know, that's where they are. So you know, it's funny how that, you know, everybody's got their segment. And in Jupiter, we allocated a ton of media to print because, you know, people that need orthopedic procedures generally are over 50. And so in that case, we allocated our mix to, to more of a print distribution rather than, um, you know, a typical digital uh, marketing program, although it is blended, but uh, it's proportionate um, to where our audience is, which is which is an older audience. So that's really important. Now, the other thing to think about is with all of these channels, and I didn't talk about it, you've got a tremendous burden on creating, you know, Instagram graphics are sized differently than Facebook graphics and they're sized differently than play. So suddenly you've got this, you know, and all of this content is disposable, you know, so once you push it out there, it's and then it disappears in purpose. So, you're, you're, as a marketing organization, you have to create the mechanism. And that's one of the things I think we're really good at is be able to create a content engine, either through written content for SEO or graphical content, which is what you need to distribute 
you know, uh, advertising and messaging across some of these other platforms like Instagram. So tremendous on um, the marketing team to be able to do that. So, um, and, and that's a, a challenge because it's resource intensive. Absolutely. Did we have any other questions? We are at 920 and I want to make sure we do some self introductions. So are there any last questions? Speak now or forever hold your peace. All right. Well, I guess we will go into some self introduction so that way we, we can know who all is in the room. James, you're at the top of my screen if you want to introduce yourself. My name is uh, James Collins. I'm an independent health insurance agent. I do health insurance, life insurance, and Medicare. And like I say, Lou, you know, I've tried it all. <laughs> Leads, print, mail, everything. I've tried it all. And the best thing I do is you get me. That's me. You get me. I go out and I talk to people. That's how it works for me the best. Yeah, no, I, yeah, you know, you're in this case where you have limited resources. So in that case, it's all referral based and, and a lot of our business is generated through referrals, the quality of the work that we do. Um, and that's not different than what, you know, how we grow our business too. So, uh, that's, you know, that personal relationship is, uh, is critically important. So that's the experience part, James, you know, we talked about, they experience you. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks James for joining us today. Uh, Bob Quitner, you want to introduce yourself real quick? Yes, hello. Can you get, hear me? Yes, you can. Okay. Yes, uh, I represent Broward Factory Service, and we have a home warranty uh, service for uh, the homeowner, and uh, it's uh, inexpensive. It uh, costs uh, $299 a year, all our own trucks, all our own mechanics, and unlimited calls. Um, so we keep you cool. And that's what Broward does. And I'm an ambassador with the chamber and thank you very much. Thanks, Bob. That was great. All right, Joan. Good morning, everyone. That was a very, very interesting presentation and I thank you for that. Um, I am with Legal Shield and ID Shield. Um, we offer very, very affordable access to the legal system for will preparation, ticket defense, 24-7 access to an attorney, plus a lot of other benefits, and identity theft protection and compensation if you become a victim of identity theft, which is like outrageous in these, this day and age. It's affecting everybody, and we just I read an article that now the hackers are getting into hospitals. Yeah. And that's scary. That is really, really scary. Um, so uh, we do all of that. And I am also an ambassador with the chamber. Thank you very much. Thanks, Joan. All right, Mark. Good morning. So again, my name is Mark Everett. I'm the campus president for South University here in West Palm Beach. I've been affiliated now with South for about, about three years and in the West Palm Beach area for just under a year and a half or so. Uh, so we're getting our feet wet. We're coming out of a, a major uh, ownership change. We're about two years in now for that ownership change. So we're getting ready to really launch a, a pretty robust campaign for rebranding purposes and really growing our existing programs. So we've, we've done quite well over the last few months despite COVID. So I'm very excited about that. It seems like some of the efforts that we put forth have kind of stabilized and we didn't see a lot of um, decline in our, in our recruitment efforts. So that's always good news. And we're getting ready to start two new programs. Uh, one is a physician assistant studies program, which we were just literally approved for uh, two days ago. Thank you very much. And uh, we're bringing into West Palm Beach a fabulous master's level anesthesia assistant program. Uh, so that's soon to be announced, uh, but for the most part, we are looking at growing here in West Palm Beach and want to uh, extend our gratitude to the Chamber. Oh, thank you so much, Mark. That is fantastic news. Congratulations on all of that. Well, that is all of us. I don't think I introduced myself in the very beginning, so I apologize for that. My name is Kirby Davis, and I'm the Membership Services Associate here at the Chamber. So it is very good to see all your faces. Thank you so much, Lou. And like I said before anybody got on the call, 
uh, I hope once we are back in person, we will be able to bring Lou in and have an in-person meeting and get to do some networking in person very soon. So please keep an eye out for any upcoming events or meetings that we will be having on our website. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. Lou, thank you so much for joining us today and being a wonderful presenter. You're very welcome. I appreciate the opportunity and uh, wish all of you much success with your marketing endeavors. And if you have questions, you're welcome to reach out to us. Absolutely. And I will send or I will get the presentation from you, Lou, if you do sure. not mind to share with the attendees. That way they have your contact information and they can contact you for any marketing needs. I will be happy to do that. I'll probably send it in a Dropbox link because it's a fairly sizable presentation. So perfect. I will keep my eye out. All right. Wonderful. All Thank right. You all. Thank you so much for joining. Bye. 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 Bye.